Good afternoon. My name is Don Fitz. I'm an interviewer with the LGBT History Project of Central Pennsylvania. Today is August 3rd, 2015. Today we're interviewing Shaka Hudson of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Shaka, can you uh, give me a little bit of backstory about Shaka Hudson? Backstory? Okay. I was born here in Harrisburg in 1949, was raised here in the city. Uh, what can I tell you? Oh, okay. During my child, my early childhood, I was, uh, during my early childhood, so much my grandmother raised us on a farm in West Virginia. So our, my childhood summers with my brothers and uh, sisters were spent on a farm in West Virginia, Kernersville, West Virginia in particular, not too far from Charlestown, where the races are. Uh, very interesting. Uh, needless to say, we... <laughs> We had very early mornings getting up and, you know, feeding the chickens and slopping hogs and that kind of thing and raising corn and working at peach orchards and cherry orchards. Uh, it was a lot of hard work on a farm, but uh, in retrospect, it was very rewarding. It taught me work ethic very early. Uh, and it taught me also uh, the love for the outdoors. I love outdoors, and I fell in love with birds at a very early age. As a result, I was spending a lot of time in West Virginia. Uh, I will say this also. I went to uh, <clears throat> the local uh, parish here in Harrisburg. It's St. Francis of Assisi. I was raised Catholic. Uh, shortly before that, I went to kindergarten in uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral. And then we, my family moved from Bow Street, uh, both and 7th Street here in Harrisburg to here, the Hill, Allison Hill section of 14th and Walnut. And subsequently, I was, me and my brothers and sisters were, uh, went to school at St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, it's very difficult in the beginning. Uh, I, I was, <laughs> I was, I, I laugh at this now because it was a blessing in disguise in a way. I, I was failed uh, in the first grade and the third grade. Uh, <laughs> so, so needless to say, I was like uh, sort of kind of introverted and uh, very low self-esteem at an early age because I, 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 I guess I, that my idea, of course, as you know, an impressionable kid is that I, I failed at something and it was hard to... Um, it was hard to uh, adapt and adjust. Uh, I could certainly work through all that kind of thing now as an adult and could have been able to do that for a long time. However, back then it wasn't easy. And uh, But the one thing that was really interesting about that whole thing was that the second year that I was uh, in, a, in the first grade, uh, we didn't change classrooms back then, or the Catholic schools didn't. So it was the same room the second year. This time around, they sat me beside a window, and uh, the only th I was kind of bored with the subject matter, so I started drawing birds. Those were the things that, you know, uh, they flew by the window, and I sat beside a window. And so I started, I had this interest in birds, and so uh, I started drawing birds. That's when my, uh, my calling as an artist took off, I guess, because I started drawing all. I st started drawing pretty soon, uh, insatiably, I would say, almost like a, what do you call it, uh, it was compulsive, impulsive, I mean, I, I drew, and, and one of the things that I think it represented at such an early age, it gave me an out to deal with things that I didn't understand at that age, so. Uh, up until the seventh grade, I stayed in Catholic school. Uh, the year President Kennedy died, 1963, we had this huge fight at the school, which I was involved in. Um, at the Catholic school? Yes, St. Francis. Uh, in, my, in my home group, on my home room, I can remember this like it was yesterday, uh, everybody was crying because of the assassination of President Kennedy. And even though I was sad, you know, you know, I knew who he was, but I, I didn't relate to him as I, 
would have, let's say, uh, somebody I was more familiar with, you know, like in my immediate family, like a family member I've had it happened. I didn't relate to him as a political figure, or, or even though I knew who he was, and my parents, you know, of course, loved him and blah, blah. But uh, anyway, what happened was uh, I was uh, one of three black children there. And uh, uh, some kids of German descent suggested that we go back to Africa because we weren't, we weren't feeling this, this angst. And so I suggested they go back to Germany, and Germany wasn't the most popular country in the world at the time. <laughs> so, of course, then we, this huge fight ensued, and, and I, uh, I pleaded with my parents to uh, take me out of school, out of that Catholic school I had had it. In fact, I had threatened that I, if they sent me there, I was going to flunk this time deliberately. And uh, so they, they, they did, and uh, went to Edison from their middle school, public school. Uh, the world opened up. It was like a whole new world for me. I was amongst children, more children of color. I, it was like a, I was like a flower head bloom. Uh, I remember experiencing this sense of freedom that I had never experienced before. Because in Catholic school, I mean, it was like really regimented. It, I, it almost felt like a military school in retrospect. You know, you could go nowhere without walking in single file or escorted even to the bathroom. You know, um, there were a lot of wonderful nuances here and there. Uh, and, and Catholics go, I, I don't want to demonize it or anything like that, but uh, it was difficult. Uh, one of the things that I really discovered at an early age also is that I had got to give me a lot of gifts. One was drawing, the other one I thought was singing, and I wanted to, I wanted to when we went to Mass, you know, I experienced the, the sound of this choir, and it sounded so angelic. I said, oh boy, I'd like to be a part of that. But they told me I couldn't. They told me I couldn't because, and they, they told me right out that it was because it was the color of my skin. And uh, that was that. It was never talked about or uh, never talked about again. Uh, what year are we talking about here? Nineteen... 60, ooh, oh, probably, uh, prob, excuse me, 1950, probably 1958, 1959. Okay. 1959, because I was nine years old. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was 1959. Um, but then after that, I had an opportunity to um, uh, be an altar boy. <laughs> that was interesting. Uh, it was interesting because uh, I, even though I couldn't sing, I could. Uh, I had a, I had a, I had a fascination for language. Uh, I guess I picked it up on. Uh, at the time, my favorite TV show was Zorro, <laughs> and uh, they spoke a little Spanish here and there, and so I, uh, I was fascinated with Spanish. I was fascinated with, uh, I was also fascinated with Indians very much because I have Indian roots, very, very, uh... American Indian? Yes, yes, Cherokee. My great-great-grandmother was Cherokee. And, uh, anyway, I had this fascination for language, and so I tried out for an altar boy, and, and I became an altar boy. <laughs> until, <laughs> until... Uh, me and this uh, kid, we we were clowning around one morning. We were lighting candles, right? And uh, for some reason, we weren't paying attention, and we set the uh, altar on fire. And uh, so that was the end of my altar boy career. But before that, <laughs> before that, I was given charge of uh, teaching other altar boys Latin, which was wonderful for me. It, it built up my self esteem. Uh, but it wasn't enough to keep me in Catholic school. <laughs> uh, and I remember uh, right before, right before I, I left Catholic school, another major incident happened. I would come home. At, well, we're like th three, four blocks away from school, and I would notice sometimes, I would notice a Valentine truck coming to the back of the convent, you know? 
glass. <laughs> and I knew my, every now and then my mother drank Valentine beer. I said, I said, what are they doing there, you know, at the back of the convent? <laughs> so I decided I was going to ask, you know, at the nun's drink. <laughs> Why did I do that? Major mistake. So I asked a kid, I asked a kid that, and he reported me to the principal. And uh, I went to the principal's office, and she decided to wash my mouth out with soap for asking the question, right? Uh, I sort of kind of, of course, it was, I was not happy with that, but for some reason I started laughing at the idea at first, and then all these bubbles started coming out, and, she, and I started laughing, right? And so she thought, you know, um, that wasn't funny, you know, and so she put more mouth in my soap to make me swallow it, so... Anyway, that was in the same year that I had, had enough. This was while you're in Harrisburg. Yes. 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 So after that, John Harris High School. Uh, after Edison, it was wonderful. You struggled in elementary. Were you still struggling academically? In high school? Mm -hmm. uh, not well, Edison. As, no, no. I I did pretty well. Um, I did pretty well. I it was. I felt uh, a lot more at ease. Um, I sort of did have this impediment about uh, math at an early age because I was, I was really deathly afraid of it. Uh, my 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 father in particular was asked to help me with math problems. He wasn't very patient with that, and so I I I got by with math, even in high school. I, um, <clears throat> but it was, to this day, it's in the, in, I have a huge impairment with math. But the one thing I really excelled in, believe it or not, uh, was algebra and geometry. And I understand geometry, that why I probably did go at it, because I'm an artist, and I sort of kind of related to the mm -hmm. shapes and things. And algebra, just because I, at the time, had a really good memory, and, and the teacher always has, you know, a, uh, to the class who wasn't paying attention much, if you can remember what I just said, <laughs> you get an A for the course. And he did that a couple of times, and I remembered everything he said, and, and I, I was able to tell the class verbatim what he said. So I got by that by a miracle, you know, just because I remembered everything he said. <laughs> so, uh, but I really had no understanding of math. And I really, uh, this day I'm getting ready to go take a couple courses because I'm really curious and I think it could uh, it could uh, it could enhance my artwork uh, and some other things that I'm doing so uh, high school high school John Harris High I went to John Harris wonderful my high school years were phenomenal went to high school uh, of course back in those days it was very very popular uh, sports John Harris, the William Penn were rivals, the Uptown School here, and uh, also Stilton. And it was huge on football. Well, me and this other close friend of mine, uh, two close friends, were artists. And it we were very popular in high school because we, we drew a lot and, and, and gave away a lot of our work. So this school was noted uh, for... Um, it didn't have a huge art program, but it opened the doors for for artists in the future because of um, I think me and my friends, my two friends, because we the uh, the one friend um, who is no longer with us um, was extremely a fine, fine, fine artist, and he was uh, we were very popular, and besides that, the football thing, and so. Uh, what else? Besides the football thing, what do you mean? When I say that, because it was so popular, you know, everybody paid attention to football, and and you were po if you were if you were popular in any school, it usually was because you were uh, an athlete. And were you? I was not. I was popular because I was an artist, mm -hmm. okay. and that was something new in high school, you know, um, at that time. So, and of course, you know, the Woodstock thing happened, in which I did go to. I went to the original Woodstock uh, right before college. I went to Penn State, uh, but before Penn State, I'm going to tell you about the Woodstock thing. 
went to Woodstock. High school uh, friends, uh, we went at two U-Haul vans, one for girls, one for the guys, and we went up there. We got tickets, but by the time we got there, we didn't need tickets. They had uh, torn down all the fences and walked off. <laughs> it was an incredible experience. Incredible. How old were you at the time? 19. 1969. I was 19. I was the oldest one in the group. And uh, had a wonderful time. Uh, my first uh, experience with drugs had uh, yellow sunshine <laughs> and uh, some other things. What, uh, what is yellow sunshine? It's an acid. Okay. It was acid, and I was introduced to... And this was about what year? 1969. Oh, 69. Okay. 1969. Okay. That was uh, the year I graduated, the year I went to college, the year the first man walked in the moon. It was an incredible year. Uh, went to Woodstock, came home, went to Penn State University, State College, Pennsylvania. I <clears throat> I was so happy to go there. I mean, all my closest friends were gone. I went there on a scholarship. and But I was really disappointed my first year because I've always known I was an artist. That was my calling. I knew that about me. So when I went there, they insisted I take all this academia first, you know. And I wasn't anti-academic. I, I loved those, all the subjects that they were going to give me, but however, I wanted to be, be immersed in what I went to school for. They said, no, 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 you're not doing it that way. You're doing it our way. So they insisted I do it. I, I held on as long as I could, and I, I became interested in dance because I had dances in the elective there. So while there i saw a dance company in washington dc that just blew me away from they, washington dc washington dc or in washington and washington dc uh and i saw them on the television uh my dance instructor at penn state her name oh that's me excuse me sure da, 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 da. why did i do that that's it Okay. This is a little editing, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. So you, you oh, didn't yeah. dance in high school? Actually, it's all no. like that. No, I did not dance in high school. My first dancing experience was with a, uh, uh, a gentleman my sister, my oldest sister had known through her friend. He was here from Philadelphia. He used to dance with... Uh, he used to dance with uh, Judith Jamison, who was the artistic oh, director oh, oh, for Matt yeah. Benelli, uh in Philadelphia. So he was here in Harrisburg. He lived here. He, has a, he had a family and was raising his two sons, and he had his wife here. So he, he was my first dance teacher. His name was Richard Wilson. At Penn State? Here in Harrisburg. My first experience. Okay, and this was before college? This was before college. Okay. I'm taking it back a little bit. But, okay. Um, in high school. Right after high school. What yeah, during you, high school. What got you started with that? What but dance, mm -hmm. I've always loved dance. That's something I, when I, even when I was in my, as a, early, uh, as a kid, I always loved dancing. It was just What something. does that mean, you always loved dancing? How did you It know? was, it was not, I mean, uh, my sisters were very popular in high school too because they, we had, uh, we had a 45 record player. And my sisters, uh, they would go to this place called Kresge's which is downtown Harrisburg, was a record store. And every weekend with their, the money they got for chores, they would get 45s. And, um, and uh, so they were very popular. We, there were lots of dances when I was a kid growing up. And so my sisters took my, my older sisters always took me with them. And I used to love to dance. And so that's, uh, and, and in fact, in high school, I got best dancer for the year. And best dressed, <laughs> whatever that means. And uh, so anyway, I, I was always in the back of my head, even though I knew I was an artist, you know, a, a graphic artist, and I, uh, you know, dance was a part of that as well. And uh, where was I? Oh, Richard Wilson, my first dance teacher here. He taught me how to fence first. He was a fencer also in college. So as a precursor to dancing, he taught me how to fence because... That way, he wanted me to get an idea of turning out. And when you're dead, when you're, you know, in a, I don't have to, uh, to fence with the foils, 
and savers. And uh, so that was, uh, that was really interesting. Here in Harrisburg, on Market Square, there used to be a dance studio right across, well, this is where the, the existing Hilton is, right there, that was Market mm -hmm. Square. Mm -hmm. And right across the street from Market Square, where City Hall is now, there was a building there that had studios there. Uh, in fact, the woman who had, uh, was the artistic, I think she probably still is, the artistic director for Pennsylvania Youth Ballet started out there. And Richard Bolson was a part of that and had a dance studio in there. And so he... About when was this? 1967 through 1969. And so... I took lessons there. You did? Mm -hmm. Indeed. No, Do you know Richard we'll Wilson? No. I, Did I, you know him? No. Okay. You never heard of him? I'll tell you the story one more. So, is her name, I'm trying to think of her name. Uh, I can't remember her name. Was it Erica? Do you know uh, the artistic director uh, for the uh, Pennsylvania Youth Ballet? I don't, I don't know who. Whatever her is. name I'm is. I'm familiar she, with the ballet. With the, yeah, she the shared, a, she shared the, uh, the same building. And uh, Richard had a uh, dance studio there. So that's where... Very yeah. now. Yes. Uh, so I was invited to take uh, dance lessons there uh, after we, he taught me how to, uh, a little bit about fencing. And uh, that's when my dancing started. And then I, <clears throat> uh, when I went to Penn State, as I said before, I took dance as an elective. And then I, after being there for about a year and a half, managed to plunk out because I wasn't interested in going to classes anymore. <laughs> and I saw a, uh, uh, a dance company up there through uh, a dance instructor. Her name was Pat Heigl, Patricia Heigl. She was my dance instructor at Penn State. And I, uh, I told my mom and dad, I said, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to Washington, D.C. I'm not coming back because they're going to take me. I was, I was so... It was like it was like one of those things you see on television, like you know somebody just goes to New York, and well, I had the same experience, but it, it wasn't that far away. I uh, it was Washington D.C., which is far enough. It's away from home. I said they're going to take me because I'm not coming back until they do. You know if they you know so they did. They gave me a four year scholarship. Now who is they? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Washington D.C. Repertory Dance Company. And theater company. Uh, there was an actor. His name was Robert Hooks, who had a television show. Uh, he was a detective with some television show. He started a school on Georgia Avenue in Washington D.C. It was a school dedicated uh, to black artists. Uh, there was a school of dance. There was a school, a theater school. There was a graphic school, there was an acting school, all in one. Uh, it is now has now become the Duke Ellington School of Performing Arts. It's a precursor to all that. In that, had some great teachers, great teachers. Uh, the name of the dance company that sprung from that was called the Washington D.C. Black Repertory Dance Company. And one of the director, directors was named Lewis Johnson, who was a very popular dancer on film and did some Broadway, uh, choreographed some Broadway plays. He was in Damn Yankees with uh, Jimmy Cagney, James Cagney. Uh, and he was, he was the artistic director for this dance company that I was uh, apprenticing for and went to school for. Uh, Debbie Allen, have you ever heard of her? Debbie mm -hmm. Allen? Mm -hmm. Well, she was one of my dance teachers. Vicki Baltimore was another one. Charles Augins. Mike, Mal Mike Malone. Michael Malone was another artistic director for the school, uh, for the dance department. I was in the right place at the right time. It was extraordinary. Extraordinary. I... I... I trained for four years, then um, uh, I, the major dancer for that company, his name was Clyde Jacques Barrett. We fell in love with each other. He was my first male lover. 
we moved to New York in 1975, and uh, this was from from DC to from Washington DC, where I lived. I was just thinking right before you said that, mm -hmm. that it's your first. This is that you hadn't mentioned anything related yet to your sexuality. Right. Right. So I wasn't sure if yes. it, it didn't happen before then. Or yes. Or... Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, yeah. I. I forgot. Like at my high school. I mean, excuse me, but even before high school. You can go but, back. You yeah, can... I want to go back to grade school. So, <laughs> <laughs> if I may. <laughs> yes, I forgot to go back. <laughs> I have to call you back, I'll, uh, all right? Yeah, I'll have to call you back, baby. Bye. Bye. Um... Uh, one of the things that was fascinating for me as a kid <laughs> that I didn't mention, which was very, uh, <laughs> this is, you're going to find this extremely funny. Uh, when I went to, <laughs> when I went to great, <laughs> when I went to grammar school, Catholic school, the one thing I thought was so very elegant were the nuns, their habits. So I wanted to grow up to be a nun. <laughs> that was, <laughs> I, just because I thought that they were just so beautiful. You know, I just like their their uniform. And I said, well, the men, the priests aren't wearing those uniforms. <laughs> so what does that mean about me? You know what I mean? And I said, you know, and um, my mom used to hang a, a sheer curtains here, right? So uh, uh, I guess that particular year, uh, she didn't hang them. And, and she, she stored them downstairs. And I used to put them over the top of my head. And we had overhead ceiling lights, right? And so they created shadows on the floor. So I used to put this, this curtain over my head and while I walked, I could see my silhouette on the floor, right? And it, I looked like a nun. <laughs> <laughs> what a story, right? <laughs> so, uh, I was, I was really fascinated with it to the point where, uh, in the summertime, one time, when we were in West Virginia, my grandmother caught me doing that, right? And she embarrassed me. She she took me on a walk to break me out of this habit. Uh, habit. The habit of the habit. <laughs> we're, we're in the habit, thinking that I was a nun, right? So she marches me down this road with my brothers and sisters in tow, and and on this road, it was very, it's a very, very country, but on the road, she knows everybody, of course, and we're passing by, and people are, are, are questioning her, why, why does he have that thing on his head? <laughs> <laughs> and then she tells him, and I started crying profusely, and she gives me... Again, how old are you? I was, like, really young. I was probably eight or seven, seven mm -hmm. or eight. And anyway, it was... Uh, it was embarrassing, of course, and then I <laughs> stopped after that. I, I didn't stop completely, but you know, when she she know, uh, she was living here for a while with us, and um, she had taken off. She went back to West Virginia, and uh, so I I quilled that part of my liking the nuns, you know, uh, and uh, but I, I I discovered then that I did, you know that I had a for men, I um, I was attracted to this one a priest too. Uh, at um, at at, uh, at at Saint Francis, he was new and he was really young. He was gorgeous. You know, I thought he was very handsome when when I was a kid. I, I gorgeous wasn't part of my language, but I <laughs> I I I thought you know this. This, this liking for men was it uh, abnormal? When I think about it, it was just natural for me. You know, people were people. Love was love, as far as I was concerned. But I think love had its place in terms of the sexes and and in, in, in terms of how we view the world. You know, be it procreation, blah blah blah. When but you anyway, when you I, say you were attracted to him, what did that mean? Attractive. I. Uh, it meant that I felt something. I mean, I, I felt the closest to my father, but it was something beyond that, you know. Um, my father wasn't very vocal to me or to my brothers and sisters. Uh, he, he, they, both, both my parents worked very hard, and uh, 
when they came home from work, it was dinner time and it was TV time. It was very little time spent with the children, you know, so we sort of had a sense of raising ourselves in a way. Except for my grandmother. My grandmother was very key in, in helping raise us. Um, but it's the things, the, thing that, the things that I was missing in, in my childhood with my father that other men I sought, or the possibilities were taking place. Uh, my grandmother's friends, uh, older friends, uh, became a part of that. She had a, a close friend, his name was Reverend, and he was like more of a father figure to me, almost like a grandfather. My grandfather had died, both my grand, my mother's father had died before when I was three years old and my grandmother, her mother, had died when I was, before I was born. So, um, though my father's side, my, my grandfather was here. In fact, they, he lived around, my father's sister lived right around the corner here. And uh, my grandfather and my grandmother were still living when I was a kid. And uh, we, were, we were close, all to say, I, I still didn't have a sense of, of a closeness with men, like uh, I didn't have a, a, a grandmother figure, except for my grandmother, who was a surrogate grandmother. My, uh, anyway, um, yeah, so I, I, wanted this, I, I wanted to experience this closeness with other men, you know, a nurturing father, you know, that, that, I didn't, that was lacking in my own home. So I started reaching out, and then and reaching out, I, I, I discovered something about myself. It didn't slap me in the face or anything like that, you know, like that I was gay, you know, or that something was wrong with me. I just thought it was natural. I guess I thought it was natural. So it became a, a sexual thing? It didn't become sexual. It, it, it sort of, it did, and I discovered that, I discovered that in, 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 in grammar school. Uh, there was a kid that I liked. <laughs> I didn't know why, but I did. And um, there was a sexual attraction there, and I didn't understand it, but I knew it was there. I never, I never, yes, I did too, when I think about it. <laughs> I did act on it once. We went to the bathroom once. We went to the bathroom once, and I asked if I could hold this thing, and he did. He let me do that. This and was grammar school. Grammar this school. was grammar school and St. Francis, and, and that was the end of that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I guess my first sexual experience was in high school. No, it wasn't. It was in it was junior high. Uh, there was a, a kid. I I went to the Boy Scouts in St. Francis, and my uncle was a scoutmaster. My my father's sister's husband was a scoutmaster, and we went to we went camping. We, a lot of great camps around here when I was a kid, and we there was a jamboree at Hershey Field, uh, right across from the, um, right behind the, uh, the the park, and uh, we pitched tents, and it was like Boy Scouts from all over Pennsylvania. It was a wonderful experience, and in that, <laughs> my first experience, besides me touching that person, and and and. But this is my second experience, and my second experience was I was paired with this kid uh, uh, and Boy Scouts, and we played around, you know, we, you know like a whole circle jerk or whatever. Um, that was, you know, it was innocent, you know, uh, that's what boys do. We do. I mean, it's a natural thing, I think. You know, girls and boys, they all explore, I think, uh, in retrospect. But anyway, it opened up, it opened up a can of worms. <laughs> There's possibilities. <laughs> there is a possibility. Did, did you date? Did you date women? Uh, da, 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 not until I had a, like a I had a little girlfriend in in, in, um, in in grammar school. It was like little flirtatious little things I did uh, in grammar school. But that, you know, was just flirtation. And then in junior high school, no. In high school, yes, I had a girlfriend. I had a girlfriend. Uh, my friend who I, uh, I was telling you about was an artist friend of mine, my closest friend. 
we both knew that we were, were we had some sexual gayness about ourselves, but we we never talked about it. But we knew it was there. We both knew it was there, but we just never talked about it. We wore masks instead. We did. We did the next. Uh, we we did things not to call that to our attention. You know, we dated like normal people did. You know. Uh, but by the time uh, Woodstock came around, we started we started a little dialogues here and there. And uh, uh, I had some sexual encounters when I went to college. I, uh, they were very, they were, how would I put this? I, I, I wasn't out as a, as a gay man, certainly not back then, but they were experiences, you know, that one experiences when they're exploring. Uh, but not until I went to Washington D.C. and joined his dance troupe that I become, you know, I chose to be with this man, and he chose to be with me, and so we, we were lovers and, and partners. And an exclusive relationship with. Someone. Yes, yes, and uh, and then there were several other men in the company. Well, well most of the men in the company were gay, but we openly formed, so. Pardon? Openly so. Oh yeah. Yes. Um, it was, was Washington, D.C. at the this time. This was like 1970. 1970, yes. 1972, I'm sorry, 1972, after I left Penn State. You did, I'm going to uh, take you back again. Okay. Uh, you talked around family, but you didn't talk about family uh, in terms of your relationship with them growing up and brothers, sisters. My brothers and sisters, okay. Um, that's Who are they? Uh, I have two older sisters. I had two younger brothers. One of them died. At, he was 18 there years were five old. of you. Five. I was the middle child. Two older sisters, two younger brothers. My youngest brother died in 1975, the year I moved to New York. As a young adult? He was 18 years old. Um, he drowned in Hershey. It was very hard. Uh, I was in dance school at the time. And I remember coming home, and it was just very, very, very hard time. Um, he was my, and I love all my brothers and sisters, but he was my favorite, you know. Um, I thought, I thought that I, I was influential to, you know, as a big brother in some positive way, but he chose to, um, and I wasn't, I was a big, I was not a big drug user, or, you know, um, I mean, I experimented at the time with, uh, you know, LSD, but that was a one-time deal, or not, not many times. Anyway, my brother, he, uh, decided he was going to smoke some pot, you know, and hang out with his friends, and they were in a, a swimming situation in Hershey. Oh. He was a wonderful swimmer and wasn't able to, uh, he was with some other people and they weren't able to, able to save him. He was, uh, they were in a turbulent water thing uh, situation and he went under and could, didn't come up. Anyway, so after that happened, uh, it was it just happened to be the year that I moved to New York. So it sort of kind of distanced me from Washington D.C. And, and here, you know. Was was your family, any of your brothers or sisters, involved in your social life? My sisters, I, I, I as I said before, they used to take me to the the parties they mm -hmm. go to. That's when I really stood out as a dancer. I mean, I loved dancing so much; it was just really natural for me. Uh, me, my sis, my the younger of my two sisters, we were really close. I used to, I used to do their hair sometimes before they go out to parties. Both of them, uh, when I say do their hair, well, uh, women, black women in particular, like used to press their hair with hot combs, and I, uh, they entrusted me to do that, and I could do it. You know, I just had uh, some pretty interesting gifts that I never knew I discovered until I did them. So anyway, um, we were close. When did they become aware of uh, uh, my sexuality? Mm -hmm. That part of you. 
I think they always knew, sort of, kind of. Uh, I never openly told them until after. I mean, they certainly knew after uh, 1972, or before that. I would say 1972. How would that? How was that? Sir? Uh, when I went to when I went to dance school. When I went to dance school, I, I and I, I I told them who I was living with. They they knew, okay. you know, you know. And how were they with that? How were they were fine. They acted fine anyway. How about mom and dad? Mom and dad, they 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 knew that I was an artist, and they, they expected, you know, their expectations of me were. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. You know, they were just they just wished me well. You know, basically, my father would have preferred me to. Uh, be a doctor not a doctor necessarily as much as uh, his brother was a, a very popular uh, barber I had a barber school here uh, Hudson Barber School and that was a possibility of me doing that or picking something to do other than going to college but he always they, everybody knew in my family that I was an artist and, and that could mean a lot of things in terms of they let me walk my own beat, basically, you know, because they knew I was going to do that anyway, because they knew I was an artist, you know, always. So I had a lot of freedom. I had a lot more freedom than my sisters. Right up the street here, uh, there was uh, Wise's Market right here on 17th and Market, and I was the first one in the family to have a job. And because I had a job, uh, I was 16, 17 years old. Your first child? The first child to, to work. Uh, um, I had a lot of freedom. I didn't have to be in. I didn't have to be in. Even though I did, of course. I mean, I had a curfew, you know. But I, my my parents were really lenient with me because I, uh, I I worked, and I brought you know things home from the from the grocery store. And, I was very selfish too. I mean, I wanted to go to New York all the time, and, you know, spend my money, go get shoes and stuff, platform shoes. I was like, uh, <laughs> I, I spent a lot of time in Philadelphia, going to Philadelphia, and then my best friend, uh, who I was telling you about, who was an artist, his brother was also an artist, a uh, commercial artist in New York, and so we would go, sometimes play hooky and go to New York. So that was really interesting. Um, but yeah, I had a lot of freedom as a, a, uh, a teenager right before college, and uh, because I worked. Uh, uh, my brothers, my brothers, my, my dad was very machismo. He, I remember when I was a young kid, younger, me and my brother next to me, my father wanted to teach us how to box, because he used to box as an amateur, he was an amateur boxer. And wanted to teach us how to box <laughs> while he put boxing gloves on me. And my brother, my brother was a lot tougher than me in that respect. And he punched me a couple of times and I started crying. <laughs> so that was the end of the boxing thing. My dad said I wasn't going to have it. He said he didn't push it. You know, he tried to for a minute, but I wasn't having it. I didn't like Did boxing. I have your brothers pick it up? Pardon? Did no, no, no. My one brother did. I mean, the one next to me that I was describing, he... He was sort of kind of, not delinquent, but he was, he, he started trying to get into trouble. You know, he ran with a gang, you know, and blah, blah, blah. But he wasn't, he didn't do anything major. He, he suffered at a, 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 when we were in high school, excuse me, junior high school, he had a curvature of the spinal cord. Mm. So he started bending over. So they had to take his fibula out of his leg, and put it in his back. So he was in Elizabethtown for... Elizabeth, yeah, Elizabeth Town down here, uh, near Lancaster, or E Town, yeah, E Town, and uh, for two years, in a cast, in a body cast. So we would go every weekend to visit him. He was spoiled after that, of course. You know, everything has to go to Albert. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and so far as my brothers are concerned, in terms of my sexuality, they didn't buck about it at all. They they accepted it. You know, we didn't talk about it much, but they accepted me. They loved me. If anybody bucked about it, it would have been my the sister, the, the sister, the, the one sister that was next to me, that I was closest to. The younger of my two sisters. Uh, 
And I say that because um, we, even though opposite distance has separated us, we were no longer close. And uh, when I moved away, even though when I came back home to visit and blah blah blah, yeah, I, I, I felt close, closer to my other brothers, my my brothers and my other sister. But then I saw my other sister sort of. We sort of kind of drifted apart in a way. Um, was there ever a point with any of your family members where you told them or they asked you? No. Well, yeah. Hold on for a second. Then. Um. Yeah. I um. I'm trying to think, but something happened. Well, yeah. There was a there was a time that I told everybody that I was you know gay. And I'm trying to think about the circumstances was. I think it, it was when I came back, right before I went to Washington D.C. I, I, after my brother had died, uh, something had come up, and I not, I can't remember exactly what. I have to dig into my subconscious. But there was an incident that I I, I outed myself, and. Uh, not intentionally. Not intentionally, no. It's just that I, I felt that it was the time that I, I was defending something. It had something to do with something political, and I said, well, okay, God damn it. <laughs> 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 so, but anyway, um, yeah, my family has, has been uh, supportive. Uh, not outright supportive. It's something that I didn't talk to them about, you know, I didn't, uh, you know, I wasn't over. I wasn't effeminate, you know, particularly, um, uh, and I think because of that, maybe they had more respect for me. In terms of that, did they meet your friends? Oh yeah, yeah. And then on top of all this, here's another story. Well, here's a, when it be when I moved to New York, I decided after having had my lover, we separated. I this thing came over me. I wanted to be with a woman. I wanted to see what that was like again. I mean, I had, I, 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 in high school, I had a girlfriend, and she, and I both went to Penn State University, and then, um, and I still, I was still, uh, she assumed and everybody else assumed that once we went to Penn State that we were still, uh, boyfriend and girlfriend, but I had this other idea. I'm in Penn State now. Like, it's time to explore, <laughs> right? Other women and other, and in other possibilities. Did you, did you have the heterosexual relationships? I did, while I was at Penn State. And then, then I also had homosexual ones, too. You know, so I was like filling everything out, you know? I wanted to know who I was, and, and, and I wanted to feel everything. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to find out, you know, what all this was coming from, and if I was making the right decision based on what I was told, you know, how I was raised, you know, I'm a man, men are supposed to be strong, you're supposed to want this and that and the other. I wanted to find out how Shaka ticked. So I had a lot of exploring to do, and what better place to explore than college, <laughs> right? That's my first stomping ground. And so I did. I, I discovered a lot of things about myself. <laughs> Uh, and then, as I said, I moved to Washington, D.C., met this man, we were lovers, and moved to New York, decided I want to be with a woman. I, I, when I wasn't dancing, I, I, I'm, I'm not, this is very interesting, this is very noteworthy, I think. This is how I, I was self-taught as an artist, but I wanted to fine-tune it and I wanted to go to school, rather than pay to go to school. I had this wonderful plan, and the plan was this. Since I was a dancer, I was going to model for all the major art schools, and I did that. And while I was there, I took notes as if I were a student, because I had the best artists were all around me. They were they were t they were teaching at the Art Students League, Parsons, FIT. You name all the art schools I modeled for, and I made sure they're going to call me back because I I would do things so difficult, you know. I would be sore afterwards, but I would, they would request me back so that I could continue coming back, so I could be a student as well. They didn't know I was a student, but I was. I mean, the, the 
professors did because I was like taking notes like more than the students were. <laughs> I was soaking up as much as I could, you know. Um, and at the Art Students League, N walks this woman, she's an Indian woman, uh, born in British Guyana. I fell head over head, hills over her. Never felt that way about any woman before. In fact, this is a really interesting story. <laughs> I, and this is how I knew that I was attracted to her. Uh, I was modeling nude, right? And this class was crowded. It was about 50 people there. It was a huge class, right? I could just bone her, right? I see this woman and she just, I mean, she's just this tiny little thing with these big eyes and she's just gorgeous. And I just get all excited, <laughs> right? I get this boner up on the stand. <laughs> And I started laughing, right? And, and people started fidgeting this stuff, right? I said, excuse me, and I ran to the dressing room. <laughs> she turned red, right? She was light, you know, light, light complexion. And uh, it was love at first sight. Um, we, got, uh, we got together. We got married. We have oh, a yeah. child. I have a child. Uh, she was born out of love. Um, but then... I thought, uh, you know, knowing that I was homosexual. She knew I, that? Yeah, she knew that. Up front? Up front. I, she thought, and I thought that I, that she could change me. Uh, we thought that, you know, this was like a passion phase, just not going to last forever kind of thing. <laughs> uh, but it didn't. All these things, these desires started coming back. And so we were married for almost 10 years. We really are in love. Um, but then I decided, you know, this is not fair to her. I, I had these, I was still attracted to men. And you were dancing this whole time? I was dancing and I was modeling. And I... Uh, what was your bread and butter? Modeling and dancing. Dancing and modeling. Um, and then she was working for the Met, uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art. So, I... Um, I decided this is unfair to both of us, so I ended it. And it was uh, she understood. Uh, uh, my daughter, she she never contested anything with her. She let me have her for all the whole summer. She made sure my I, she was three years old when we did, we separated. I had her the whole summer. I had her all the major holidays up until she was a teenager. I mean, every holiday, all Christmases, all Thanksgiving. Uh, so she never, she was always very wonderful about that. And uh, so we, we, we parted amicably. Uh, and uh, yeah, that was one of the love. You know, how I've come through my life with the loves of my life, you know, I don't have one single love of my life, you know what I mean? You know, there's, there's loves in, our, in my life, in my experiences, I've had many loves of my life, you know, it's wonderful people that have come and gone. She was one of them. She's the mother of my child. Um, still love her very much, and... Uh, do, you commit, do you have a relationship? We do not. We do not have a relationship, and the reason why, why one of the reasons why we don't have a relationship is because I took on a, my next lover after the one I was telling you about, who was white, who was from where I, I spent time in Mount Carmel. He was of uh, Italian German descent, and um, was extreme. He was fourteen years my junior. Mistake. <laughs> Made a few of us, but that was pretty major. Anyway, I thought it was, I, I was in love with this person, uh, but clearly the distance in age, or the difference in age was something I, I wish I would have looked at it a little differently, but it, it taught me more than, you know, I, than I have regrets about, you know what I mean? It, um, we're the best of friends now. In fact, he had just called me while we were sitting here. Um... He was extremely jealous of her. I said, you know what, she's a part of the package. She's, and he loved my daughter, you know, when she came for the summers and stuff, he, he would treat her just so wonderfully and spoiled, her, spoiled her. And uh, I let him do that and it was fine. Um, but then 
he was really jealous of. I said, how are you going to be jealous of a woman? You're not a woman. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, and I said, you know, but if you can't accept this, you know, her and uh, my, you know, he accepted my daughter. And I said, you, you know, so they met and he, he, he was fine with it after a while. You know, he was just young and stupid. Anyway, from there, um, I was with this man for almost 19 years, 15 years, I would say 15, 16 years. I... Okay, we have to stop for okay. a minute. Uh, no, okay, so that was not in New York, that was here. Oh, well, that was back here. Oh, yeah, that was here. All right. Uh, when I... Came back into Harrisburg? Yeah, hold on, let me, let me back up here. After, after me, my, my ex-wife divorced. Are you on? We're all right. Uh, after we divorced, I met a, a fellow up there uh, through a friend of mine who lived right around a corner. In Harrisburg. In, uh, and New York City. Okay. And he, this guy was mad over heels in love with me for some reason. Anyway, I, uh, and I was splitting up with my ex-wife and so was, he lived in Virginia, oh. Richmond, Virginia. So he offered me sanctuary in, in Richmond. And so I, I moved. And it was perfect, too, because I didn't want to come back here. I, I wanted to leave New York because I, I just didn't want to be there anymore. I had had enough, you know, especially I, I, I didn't take, even though I knew it was best for both of us, you know, to, to, to part ways. It was very difficult, very difficult. I fell apart, actually. And, and this person comes and grabs me from out of nowhere. I mean, through a friend and in love with me and offers me sanctuary, as I said, in, in Richmond, Virginia. So I moved to Richmond, Virginia. Took everything I had and what I didn't take with me, I sold. Moved to Richmond, Virginia and took this person on. Uh, he was from Minnesota. Minnesota. I've never been to Minnesota in my life and I still haven't been there. I passed through it. But uh, all to say that when I went to Richmond, Virginia, I, one of the reasons why I was so thankful about Richmond is because I didn't want to come back here. I thought it was too small from New York City to Harrisburg. Wasn't ready for that. I wanted to go someplace that, you know, anyway, it, it turned out it was going to be Richmond. I went there. And this was about when? 19... Oh, 1987? Okay. 1987. I moved there. 88, 1988. And anyway, was there... And this was the first person after your marriage? Yes. I gotcha. Yes. Um, so, moved to Richmond, Virginia. Discovered this person was very... He was loving at first, but he was very, uh, what's the word I want to say? He was very promiscuous. And uh, uh, promiscuous to the point where it was very noticeable. And we lived together, discovered that this, that he was very sick and I didn't know what he was sick of. And, um, we would be having dinner, and all of a sudden he would just black out in the middle of a sentence. I said, what's the matter with you? I need to take you to the hospital, blah, blah, blah. He had AIDS and um, didn't tell me until he was dying. He knew it, but he didn't tell. Yeah, and then he passed it on to me. Uh, and one of the things that I'll, I'll never forget is it's, it, we're all going to die, meaning we all, all of us gays are going to die from AIDS, is what he told me. I said, you know what? What a gift. Thank you. Uh, you know, we have choices, you know what I mean? I, you know, I just thought it was extremely selfish of him, and I, I forgave him and all that, but... Uh, did he die? He did. 
he died while I was there. That was very difficult. So how I, long were you with him? Two years, about two oh, years. My. Yeah, he passed it on to me. And were you exclusive when you were married? Uh, toward the end, no. Exclusive in the beginning, yes, but then that, that thing emerged. I mean, that my insatiable, not insatiable, I said my appetite for men reappeared, you know, and I, and I, and I told my, my wife that, you know, this is not fair for me or her, that I, you know, I still have these feelings and we parted. But you were, you were married during the early onset of AIDS. No. No? This is after that. This is after that. No, but you were married during the Oh, yes. Yeah. The, the, the onset of eight, yeah. Yeah, but I didn't have that then, yeah. Um, yeah, this is not until after my marriage uh, that I moved to Virginia. Anyway, he, um, he infected me, and so I was, I knew exactly that how, it had, how I got it. It was from him. It was 1987. So I've been have I've had it, I'm HIV positive at the moment. All my friends, I will say, all my major friends are gone because of AIDS. All of them. I mean, all my best the, my best friend in high school is gone. Uh, the last of my best friends in New York, a couple of years, five years ago, died. Uh, I've had I mean I have new friends, but. Uh, all my friends of yesterday are gone. I'm the only someone to survive. It's amazing. Um, You're doing well? I feel well. I feel really good. Yeah. I, uh, and it's interesting too. I am at a point where I've had this cocktail that I've been on for the last 10 years. One of the ongoing things is that I've asked my physician, my, my doctor, to, to change it because I'm, what if I, I'm experiencing side effects, right? And He's done it for three years and he doesn't change it. I said, it's time for a new doctor. And I'm thinking, I can't help think that it's a money related thing because I could be taking this one pill that I'm eligible for and have been eligible for for three years. And every time I see him every three months, I said, why hasn't this happened? Oh, I'll get that done right away. He never changes it to the one pill cocktail, which leads me to believe that the three cocktails that I am are, are a lot more costly and it's, he's getting some kind of kickback from it. Pardon? Could be. Yes, but anyway, so he hasn't changed, so I t you know, it's time for a new doctor, obviously, because I'm feeling lethargic a lot of, more than I should be. And this is one of the side effects from one of the meds that I'm on. Uh, so anyway, that's going to change soon. <laughs> so you moved after, after Virginia? Back here. But to Harrisburg? Back to Harrisburg, yeah. My father- Were you working when you were in Virginia? I did, I was doing construction, construction work. Um, Dancing on the job? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> actually, after, uh, during, I was doing construction, and I was also teaching uh, rope jumping to boxers in a boxing situation, uh, just because I just knew how to jump rope. I guess it's one of the other effeminate You're things. I, I, yes, but I, yeah, I really learned how to jump, jump rope well. In fact, outside, upstairs, up and downstairs, that kind of, you know, challenging thing. And uh, taught uh, rope jumping to boxers down there while I was uh, doing construction work. Moved back to Harrisburg. My father, on, uh, right after his 70th birthday, he died in 1993. Uh, we were never really super close, but we became close during his last year. He had a, he had a, uh, a therapist, uh, uh, a physical therapist come in and give him massages. He dismissed her because I gave him, gave him better massages. And it was a way of us connecting. So we did. And uh, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. I've always loved my father. I never hated him. I, uh, I always wished that he could have done a better job. Um, they were together the whole time. My, my parents, yes, babe, yeah, absolutely. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, we said our goodbyes, and so what happened? He died of uh, prostate cancer. Okay. What so happened back here? Pardon? What happened when you moved back here? You've been back since. Uh, no, no. I the lover I was telling you about that I met here. Oh, and did I, I live with in Mark Carmel, right? 
We moved back to Harrisburg once. How'd you get to Mount Carmel? He lived there. Okay. He lived you met there. met him here? I met him here in Harrisburg, but he, was, he lived in Mount Carmel. So we lived in Mount Carmel for two years, and I came back here. We got a place together here. I lived up there with him and his grandmother. Um, this was the white boy? The white boy, yes. Yeah, the white young man. The German. The German Italian descent, yes. And, um, oh boy, he had a life. He was molested at an early age. Should I say this? Yeah. He was molested at an early age and uh, by a priest. And we had occasion to work while we were up there. We not only worked in the tomato factory, we, we commuted every day to um, Kina, Prussia to work at restaurants. We were servers. And he runs into the priest that molested him. As a server? As a server. We're in the middle of serving in, in uh, this hotel that we worked in. And, and this priest is there. We're serving, and next thing I hear all this breakage, you know. And he's standing on the floor shaking like this uncontrollably. And he was carrying some food, and, and he saw this priest. The priest didn't recognize him. So he, he runs out of the... He runs out of the restaurant. I go get him. I, he tells me what's going on. We, we start going to see a therapist, and, and he didn't follow through with it. So I will say this with that, uh, not only was that present by, uh, <clears throat> that was part of his story with the priest, it was also within his family. He was molested sexually. And, uh, it manifested itself through our relationship too. I, I, this is not a pity party in terms of that. I, it, it, a lot of his, his um, unable, his inability to work through that with a, a person that, from an outside source, you know, like psychiatrist or whatever manifests itself with me, you know, in terms of our relationship. It was really unhealthy. <clears throat> and awesome. I'll get to that. Uh, it was unhealthy and it was toxic. So as a result of that, we started using, we started, uh, we started drinking pretty heavily sometimes. And then we uh, had our, our running with drugs. Oh, you're down in Harrisburg? Harrisburg here, yes. And then after working here as servers, we decided we were going to try Baltimore. So we lived in Baltimore for seven years. I lived in Baltimore for seven years. He did for eight. I came back. I could not do it anymore with him. So I, I moved back here with my mom. Uh, that he, is he, about when? Uh, 2005. Okay. 2005, I moved back here. So I've been back here exactly 10 years. 10 years of, as of May of this year. So anyway, uh, he has a new lover, blah, blah, blah. Um, we, we get along. He's in Harrisburg? He's in Baltimore still. Okay. He had moved back here. They got a house together and they moved back to Baltimore. They wanted to be in Baltimore. I have never lived in a city that I've lived in before a second time around. Um, he came back here. Let me back up. In 2005, I moved back here. He comes back after being in Baltimore still, chose another person to be with uh, because he cheated on me ins incessantly and I still kept him. I mean, I still took, you know, I still loved him. But anyway, I said enough is enough. You know, I had enough and I, I prayed, I prayed really hard to get me out of that because I didn't know, how, I was stuck and stupid. I was in one of those relationships. You know, I didn't know how to get out of it, you know. So but anyway, it happened. We, uh, one of his friends invited us to South Carolina and we went down there, he did some outrageous things and he sent us, uh, uh, he sent us back because we had run out of money. He's, we had, he gave us, uh, plane tickets to come down and visit him. And my, my partner then abused all that and uh, 
ran up a bar bill of his, and uh, he sent us back by bus. But and by the time we got back here, he he was cheating on me down there, and I said, you know what, I had had enough, so I, we parted. So then he moved back to to Baltimore. I came back here. Um, we started up a relationship again, and then, uh, then, I'm sorry, I, I mixed this around. After we, he came back here, after I had moved back, he moved back a year after me. And in that year, when he came back, we decided to get together again. Uh, and we, moved, we got an apartment. And old behavior started reappearing. So, so I, I, and then that's when the story happened. We went to South Carolina. His best friend's mother had died, and he, and he came into some money and, and sent for us. And my my ex lover, my ex, did some horrible things down there. And he, this friend of ours uh, decided to send us back by bus. Once we got back here, I ended our relationship. I had enough. So, um, <clears throat> he met a fellow. Uh, they became lovers, and they are together still in Baltimore. We all hang out together. I mean, I go down there to, to visit them. You know, we're friends, and uh, things are f fine in terms of that. He's also he's also HIV positive. Now, even though I knew I was HIV positive since I'm 1987, he was We were both officially diagnosed in 1996 and uh, <clears throat> yeah he's doing fine he's doing fine I'm and I'm doing fine too thank God uh, I will say this too let me n let me mention something since uh, I, I mentioned uh, I put out there the age of I this generation right now they think because because uh, HIV positive people have a, a good chance of surviving, which we do, uh, that they don't feel threatened like, the, you know, they, they don't think it's as threatening as it used to be. You know, they don't have a, people dying in record numbers as in the onstart of this, you know, because people were dying like flies. I was a part of that. I mean, I, like, I can attest to all my friends are gone. But a lot of uh, this generation right now, some, they're coming around now, and I think they're getting better at it, but there's a lot of people still out there that are very careless sexually, you know, thinking that I can act this way, I can be unprotected because I'm going to, there's a cure at the end for me, which is a horrible attitude. People aren't dying now. Yes. They still are. I mean, it's still an epidemic as far as I know, I mean, but they see, they see that as people are dying now. They're exactly. Dying. Not like in market numbers as they were, which is very sad because it's, you know, it's better to be informed than it is not to be informed. So anyway, what else can I say here? Um, I want to say... Um, are you working now? I am not. Officially. I, I'm doing my artwork. I'm an artist. Um, Everything on the wall is what's your, mine. What's your, your medium? Everything. I mean, I, 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 um, I do pen, pencil. I did that when I was... That's great. This is all portrait. 1980. Oh, yeah. That's really Yeah, nice. all these. That, those are in high school over there. Um, are those your uh, nieces and nephews? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, interesting, too, there. I have a niece, my nieces, both my nieces are married to white men. So it's really interesting to see this interesting, it's a very interesting thing to see this dichotomy in um, uh, just the encompassing of races here, um, or, or the marriage there, or miscegenation, um, and the attitudes of, that, that come with it. Because in my day, it was more if you were mixed, it was, you know, it was basically, you were still black, you know? These days you still are, but it's a little, it's more, the acceptability is a lot more acceptable. Uh, and it's interesting to see how 
my, my grand nephews and nieces uh, compliment both their mother and their fathers. Do you know what I mean? It's, you know, they're not one particular culture. They're a combination of, and they love it. You know, it's, it's, and it's a lot more, that was another thing that I didn't mention either. When I was in high school, that was a very, very popular th thing to, to date uh, uh, out of your race. It was, very po it was very popular also that, you know, when I was a kid also, it, it was not unusual for young girls to have children. I mean, it, it was, especially here in Harrisburg, there were a lot of young mothers when I was in high school, you know, out of wedlock, you know. Uh, Harrisburg is a very interesting place. As, as much as I've, I've been away from here for 40 years, and I, I love it here. I absolutely love Harrisburg. There's, there's some incredible possibilities here. To me, it seems like there's a little spark here right now. You know, I, I would love to see, I would love to see industry come back here. Where's the spark? The spark is, there's artists here. There's, there's people here that are opening businesses. Um, this show? Um, I'm going to. I've had- at I've, The LGBT I've, Center? I, I, I'm looking at that possibility. I am, um, but uh, I, I'm excited about, you know, the possibility of uh, staying here, because I, you know, I'm here with me. Staying here in Harrisburg. Oh, okay. Because it were me not, being a caretaker, I wouldn't be here. I'd be in, I'd be in Spain. Because uh, it's something about a place I've always wanted to live and I'm still gonna live there one day, I'm sure. <laughs> Just as sure as like, I knew that I was gonna one day live in New York as I'm a dancer that's gonna take me there. But my artwork is gonna take me to Spain eventually. Um, the other reason why I, I, I would love to go to Spain is because I have a, I have this insatiable thing for, for, for flamenco. And one of the things that I mentioned earlier is that in my childhood, I loved Zorro. And one of the things that was introduced to me was some flamenco dances every now and then. And there's something about flamenco, I don't know, maybe I have some Spanish pass or something. But there's well, something about that, that the fire is very fiery, it's very passionate. Uh, and I love, I love tap dancing, and I love that, that kind of tap dancing. So, Do you I'm still gonna, dance? Oh yeah, I dance every day. What was your, <laughs> what was your uh, ballet? Ballet. Ballet, modern dance, little tap. So a little bit of everything. Little bit of everything. On Broadway, you have to do everything. On Broadway, I was more, I wasn't a major, major dancer. I didn't have any major uh, uh, dance uh, roles as much as I was a, a hoofer which means in some circles is a tapper, but it's also, it's also a dancer who is an understudy for other dancers. And that is so stressful. Because that means you have a show like yeah, Bubbling yeah. Brown Sugar, for instance, or Ain't Misbehaving, which I did. You have to learn all the men's parts in case somebody calls off. You have to be on standby. You get paid well for it, but you should get paid well for it because it's stressful. You know, shocker, you need to do this. You know, you're going to do Tony's role tonight, and you got to be prepared. You know, that's what they pay you for. So anyway, um, I still dance. I still, I would love to open a dance school. And that dance school, I would love to open, what I'd really like to open here is, I would like to, I don't know if this has ever existed, but if I had the money, I would open a, a, a school where people, uh, with creative abilities could come and, 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 and do something for this school. You know, whatever your particular talent is, I would have to discover some criteria for you to get there and stay there. But you know, like for me, if I had a place where I could go to and get all this stuff out of my head as an artist, it, I, I would be the happiest person in the world. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, where I could go express, like let's say, choreographically what I would like to do. You know, I, um, I can't afford to do that right now. I can't afford, to, well, I am affording to, I'm getting my stuff, I'm gonna get things together enough for an art show, a one man show soon. I am, um, I'm also a sculptor. And what I like most of, I mean, I've done 
um, I've done clay. I'm a modeler. Uh, and a modeler as opposed to a, 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 what do you call it, the other, the opposite one. A modeler is a modeler that works in clay. He models, you know, as opposed to taking away, chipping away. So I um, currently, and, and the last time I was really into it was paper mache because paper is everywhere. I mean, I don't have to buy paper. I can just get the newspaper. And I would take armatures, you know, made out of wire and build it up with, uh, like, for instance, um, I'd have vats of uh, wallpaper paste with newspaper. And then before that, mach wash machine lint. So I keep building up and building up, and that would end up with corrugated cardboard because it has those little arches in it. And it, once it gets really uh, wet, you still have the arches in it, but when, when it's wet, it gets very flexible. And then you put it over top of the newspaper, and it becomes like this. It becomes very hard, you know. Anyway, um, I'm also I'm working on a series of masks right now. Um, using car parts, uh, things that I find. I walk the State Street Bridge every day because I go to the Y to work out, and people like throw all kinds of stuff on that bridge, so I collect it. <laughs> and I use it in my sculpture. I also use, uh, I use bones. I, all the bones that I ever usually eat, I save, and I polish them with Dremels. I soak them in uh, Clorox, and I incorporate them in my, my mask making. So I'm recycling bones. <laughs> Interesting, right? <laughs> I think so too. So one of these days, I, when I have a show up, I'll make sure that you guys get an invite. Um, what else can I tell you? My life is very rich. To me, uh, I've had many, many experiences. I mean, New York alone was an incredible experience. Washington, D.C. I, um, I was going to say, in Washington, D.C., I went to, my teachers told me, the first day I showed up to school, they told me, you're going to have to eat, sleep, and breathe dance. I said, what the hell are you talking about? And they were right. It, it, it is, I mean, I'm sure it, it happens in all art forms, but particularly dance, you really do have to eat, sleep, and breathe it. I mean, I had to put bars on my, my apartment to stretch, you know, constantly. I had no social life whatsoever in Washington, D.C. That's a lie. <laughs> what I meant to say, I had very little social life. <laughs> I, lived in, I lived in Adams Morgan, part of uh, Washington, D.C. I love it there. I lived on 16th Street. Um, wonderful Northwest. Meridian Hill, I guess, is also called around from Adams Morgan. It was wonderful. But I remember just being in classes all the time. After three classes a day, you can't do anymore. <laughs> Not in class anyway, but at home I did. So, but anyway, very little. Oh, let me tell you about this other thing that I, I didn't mention. While in Washington, D.C., I met uh, Rudolf Nureyev. You know who that was? Uh, he was very, very openly gay and very, very, very promiscuous. And I saw him at a lot of parties there. He was a wonderful person, though. Gorgeous man. Uh, when I first moved to New York, I used to take class with the Mike Mikhail Baryshnikov because he used to dance for ABT, American Ballet Theater. My memory of that is that this man was so phenomenal, I, I couldn't take class. I just stood there. I mean, I, I couldn't. I just, I was just too much in awe. I mean, he was gorgeous. He was like a dancer I've never seen, even, uh, he, uh, even though him and uh, he and uh, Rudolf Norea were, Nureyev were Russian. Their, their body types were completely different. Um, Rudolf, he was more elongated. He was more linear. Baryshnikov was linear too, but oh my God, he had, this, he had the absolute, I, I've never seen anybody, anybody, including, uh, uh, what's the basketball legend? Michael Jordan stayed in the air that long. This man, and, and in ballet, it's called ballon. Uh, it gives you the ability to stay in the air. Well, I, this, when is he coming down? I mean, amazing. You couldn't believe it. I mean, but be in the air and pause 
it was seemed like pause. He was traveling, but you know, it was unbelievable that he had this amazing gift. So, um, and then there's another ballet dancer from, well, well from Pennsylvania. Her name was, uh, she was from Bethlehem. Her name was Chelsea Kirkland. She also danced with ABT at the time. Um, just awesome, awesome crowd. But let me tell you a little story about my, my experience with dancers. The least people I want to be around, assholes. <laughs> Just because, and here's, and not by their own design necessarily, but this is the reason. Dancers are such an interesting breed of people that, and, and I say that because we're so, uh, when you're in a dance world, you have very little time for anything else. Your social skills become nail. Your, your social skills only involve other dancers usually, and they can be some vicious, vicious people. I mean, vicious. I didn't know vicious was until I became a dancer. Um, so all to say this, uh, when I wasn't dancing, I did, I did not hang around dancers. <laughs> I didn't. I deliberate. And, and actors also, they're another one. <laughs> and, and it's not to take away from their, 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 their skill. I mean, their skill is wonderful. And, it, and when you think about the sacrifices that they go through to get it, you know, like you would say, like, okay, you're excused and stuff. But some of this stuff is, from another dancer's point of view, no, <laughs> I can't live like that, you know. And it's so cutthroat. I mean, I mean, the, humili the humiliation on ca cattle calls. You know what a cattle call is, right? Mm -hmm. Basically, so in cattle calls. Uh, and you know, there's always going to be somebody better than you. You know that. You know that's on the outside. That's a given. But still, it doesn't feel good to get rejected. You know. So then you're you're like in a, these massive auditions up in New York, and the, <laughs> why didn't you pick that bitch over me? And somebody has something that the producers and directors want that, that you don't have. You know, panache, whatever it is they're looking for. So you get over it, you know, you accept it, you know, and you get on with your life because there's a thousand and five dancers in every audition. And somebody's not good. Somebody's going to get chosen. Somebody else is not. But the other thing, too, is that the best bodies there in the world, too, which that that door was that's not the door that I like that that was open to me as a as a gay male. I met some wonderful, um, you know, but I, it. it and in, in my life, I think, in terms of encompassing everything that I can as an artist, I always have to check my ego because egos can be, get out of hand. And when my ego gets out of hand, what I mean by that is that uh, I have to make sure that I'm in balance to be healthy. And when I mean healthy, I mean all around healthy, mentally, spiritually, physically. You know, I have to, I have to balance all those things and make sure that they all work. And that I'm not giving any one th of those things more precedent over the other. Because if I do, I become unbalanced. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's the thing that keeps me breathing, number one. Number two, it keeps me healthy. I make sure I eat really well. I consume large amounts of blueberries, not because it's popular. This is because I've always loved them. I, I, I have nuts in my diet. I try to stay away from anything white, usually because it means it's just processed food, you know, like white bread. I stay away from that. I eat a lot of greens, lots of vegetables. Bananas are my staple. <laughs> I make sure she eats well. Uh, now we eat, I'll have occasional fried chicken every now and then, like once a week. <laughs> but not many, much fried food. I try not to fry food. Uh, steam a lot of stuff and make sure we eat a lot of vegetables. I think it's Is so important. Oh, I love her to cook. She does it. It's because I love to cook so much, she, she doesn't cook at all. And I would just love to come downstairs one morning and smell some something cooking. <laughs> she, I, got her to, I got her to cook one thing. She, she, I adore her chicken dumplings. And uh, I got her to make those for me about a year ago, for the first time I've been here. It's the only meal she's ever done since I've been here since 2005. 
because she knows I love to cook, and I, so she lets me do that. But she's, I'm starting to give her a little more things to do. <laughs> I tell her by October she'll be running a marathon. <laughs> I'm taking her for walks. She cannot stand the heat. She cannot stand the heat. So I'm waiting for fall, falls right around the corner. So that's her time, and I'll take her out for walks. She goes to church. Turn off our air conditioner. What's that? And now we turn off our air conditioner. Yes, yes. Have we missed anything? Um, I probably you have, but I don't think anything major. Um, it's really a very, very good interview. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't think anything major that is missed. Have mis you had any connection with the gay community here in Very interesting you bring that up. And one of the things I would like to say about that, I, I, I know without a shadow of a doubt, there's a huge gay community here. But I'm thinking, when I went to, when I went to the, uh, uh, the Pride this year, I was so horribly disappointed. I'm thinking, don't we have sponsors? to sponsor this thing or don't people come together in, in such a way that well in advance of a year time for pride that things will be in place. I would love to be, a, I, I, to know something about the committee who, who does this because it needs re, get, redoing. Get uh, yeah. We'd love to have you on the Yeah, it, it needs redoing some rethinking or something. I, I mean, I I've never known any pride without a parade. Where's the parade? And up until a couple of years ago, there was. I know. The last time I was at one was a parade. That's not, is that true? Yes. Well, I think part of the problem is it's so expensive. It is. Is it but, like 10 but just to rent the park? But here's one thing I, I have really questioned. I mean, one thing that comes off the top of my even though, like, I know people need to show their support for the LGBT center and, and blah, blah, blah. But I'm thinking if you close off, if you charge people, which $9 is nothing as far as I'm concerned to charge, but then you're excluding a whole yeah. city of people that could be there supporting the, the whole thing as a whole. But it's 10 grand just to, to rent that park. Is it that expensive? That's ridiculous. That's, which is one of the reasons that is they don't have a so parade ridiculous. Because it would be more you know what I would love to see? I would like to see this at a state level uh, the pride, that, that we could have communities from all over Pennsylvania come here assemble here and not even have it at the park, have it at the Capitol or near the Capitol grounds. I would love to be a part of that committee. I, me and some friends are we'll from New York, uh, who's also lived in New oh, York. You've already mentioned Louie. Yes. Talk with Louie. Yeah, I'm going to come down and find out uh, and be a part Louis of it. Louie or Pat. I and I also want to see what's going on in the city. I think Pat and Fuss is doing a pretty okay job, as far as I can tell. But there's some other things that need to be, there's a lot of things that need to be addressed in this community our community as a whole. One of the things for me that I really, really miss as a kid is when we, when we, when I was a kid here, the police and the firemen were an integral part of this community. They walked up and down the street. I, we knew all their names. They didn't come in from away when some, there was trouble because they were already here. They were a part of the community. People did not have to lock their doors when I was a kid here. <laughs> do now, that's for sure. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that's one of the things that's missing about, you know, they're not a part of the community, and I think they need to be, instead of implementing the, and I don't think this is just particular, you know, in our area, I yeah, think this is across America. We, I, I, I like to be a part of that resurgence of, 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 of police, because they're human beings, they're not, they're, they're human beings like we are. Do you know what I mean? And they need to realize just because you carry a gun doesn't mean that you're, you, you have that kind of power to, you know, shoot first and ask questions later. So it's not that kind of... Happening. Yeah, it does, you know, more and more. It's ridiculous. We've got to turn that around. And it's not about me complaining about without offering a solution either. You know, I, you know people will say, well, this is, the world is like this. I said, what the hell are you doing to try to change it? You know, you can, we, everybody knows what the problems are. What are you doing to change it? Do you have a solution? This here is a solution. What's your solution? You know what I mean? You don't have a solution. Shut up. <laughs> it's not about shut up. Or, you know, but you exercise your right you know, to vote. Like, same thing for voting. You know how long it's taken us for me as a black man to be able to vote? I'm using my vote every time I can get a chance. You know what I mean? You know, and people say, you know, you, you have to exercise your vote. You know, you don't. 
you, the things, and it's a privilege to vote in this country, you know. We can't assume that it's, you know, well, it's our right to vote. You know, we've earned it, we've, we've fought for it. You know, use it. Don't complain. You know, get out and vote. Anyway, I think that's it. Uh, do we have your permission to, uh, uh, to record this interview? Absolutely.